uh, I was asked to uh, present together with Haggai an alternative view. Uh, so I think I'm, uh, I can do a little bit uh, more provocative title than, uh, than in a normal talk. So I will, uh, I will try to make a case uh, that mass loss in common envelope happens on, uh, on a relatively long time scale. And the reason for this is that because we see it happening this way. So the, uh, the work uh, that, uh, that I'll be showing is done together with Brian. And he actually showed some of my slides uh, yesterday. Uh, but also other people, including uh, people in my, uh, in my group in Prague. So the motivation for this are luminous red novae, or transients associated with catastrophic binary interactions. And Brian already discussed uh, how we can explain their light curves. Uh, you can see that the light curves have a relatively large spread in luminosities and durations, and they have the complex morphology. But uh, the important thing, I think, is that many of these events uh, show very, uh, very distinguished behavior before, uh, before the main peak. And uh, uh, to, to explain these events and to connect them with these catastrophic binary interactions, the best case, and probably the only case with solid evidence, uh, is V1309 Scorpi. So I will talk uh, a lot about this event. So V1309 was discovered in 2008, but uh, relatively soon, Thailand et al. found that there is uh, OGLE data going back maybe six years before the outburst. Uh, it shows the object brighten slowly, then fade, and then brighten again. And then there is a short period variability. So when this variability is faced with uh, the orbital period, uh, what they found was that the shape of the light curve changes quite dramatically. So about six years before the outburst, the light curve looks like a normal contact binary, two stars touching each other. Uh, it has two humps per orbital period because the binary has mirror symmetry with respect to the binary axis. But over the next few years, the light curve gradually transformed from a double hump to a single hump curve. This means that the object that's in the center somehow lost this mirror symmetry with respect to its uh, orbital period. While this was happening, the orbital period was also decreasing. The period change was accelerating on a time scale of a few years, and the total period change was about 2 or 3%. So on one hand, this is a lot. This is probably the highest ever recorded period change, uh, maybe surpassed by LIGO binaries. But on the other hand, it's only 2%. So this means that the physical size of the object changed only by about, uh, by about 2%. So this long-term behavior uh, means that it's very hard to reproduce what we are seeing in this event using uh, the usual explicit fully compressible simulations. This is about 2,000 orbits uh, or so. Uh, I think that it also implies that this evolution was controlled by processes close to the surface of the binary, because the size changed only by a few percent. And that these processes might not be adiabatic, because the cooling and diffusion timescales close to the surface are, uh, uh, can be much shorter than for the, uh, than for the whole star. Uh, the third weird feature of the 1309 scope was the uh, actual brightening. So the object brightened gradually over about 200 days, about 150 orbital periods of the binary to the maximum. This is very different from usual uh, transients like novae and supernovae, where the brightening is very fast and associated with some kind of explosive uh, ejection. Here, uh, it took a relatively long time. But here, we can see that uh, there is a break in the light curve, even though that there are no data. And this implies that uh, the evolution from sort of here onwards to this peak was, uh, was dynamical. Uh, this, this light curve also implies that uh, whatever happened before the main peak, this gradual brightening, was potentially very important. It brightened by about five magnitudes in 200 days, and then by another uh, four or five magnitudes after that. So this is uh, not a small correction, but a relatively big, uh, big event. I'm also putting uh, bars showing uh, 10 original orbital periods of the binary to, uh, to try to make connection with, uh, with these fully compressible simulations. So the idea how to explain uh, these features uh, that we have pursued over the past few years <coughs> is that the binary 
that's uh, in the center, the contact binary, has somehow expanded and uh, started touching its outer critical surface. And as that happened, it started leaking out uh, material out of the L2 point, which creates this garden sprinkle spiral that's, uh, that's coming out. This material obscures the binary in the center and uh, eventually causes the brightening. You can see that the material that's coming out does not have the mirror symmetry with respect to the binary axis, so there is already some indication that, uh, that we could do something interesting there. This model has an advantage that it gives very uh, precise relation between the directly observed orbit material uh, and the muscle ray that's coming out of the binary that we could potentially infer. And the constant of proportionality is basically the specific angular momentum of the, of the L2 point. Eventually, the stream that's coming out will also shine, and the luminosity should be proportional to the muscle ray. But in order to do better than this little, we have to do a substantial amount of work. So the idea, uh, in short, is that uh, the muscle ray from L2 runs away on a time scale of 100 to uh, thousands of days. And uh, that uh, explains uh, what, what happened in the binary, as is nicely illustrated by, uh, by Stephen Colbert uh, in uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, now more about L2 muscles. So how did we, what did we do about this? We did a SPH simulation of this process, but it's different from the simulations that we've uh, seen before. We do not simulate the binary, we replace it with two-point masses, and we inject the particles close to the L2 point. So the savings uh, in computational time can be then spent on uh, things that are relevant for radiative properties, like realistic equation of state, radiative diffusion and cooling, irradiation by the central binary, etc. So we studied the gas dynamics of this process, determined luminosity, subjective temperature, and tried to understand this with semi-analytic models. So what, do we, what did we find? Uh, previous investigations of L2 muscles used uh, basically just uh, correlation and test particles, and they found two potent possible outcomes depending on the mass ratio of the binary, which uh, relates to the efficiency of tidal torques of the binary. But with hydrodynamics and radiation, there are other parameters that enter. Uh, one is the initial temperature, which is basically the surface temperature of the contact binary. And the other is efficiency of radiative cooling, which we parameterize by the ratio of diffusion uh, to advection time scales. So we can get uh, various uh, unbound outflows uh, with various opening angles. We can get uh, excretion this, but it only happens if when the material is uh, radiatively cooling and can actually collapse within this. But uh, we can also get isotropic outflow when material does not cool efficiently is close to the binary, and the binary deposits more energy uh, into, uh, into the subject. So my uh, student, Dominica, is uh, ready to submit a paper on uh, L2 muscles and how it depends on, uh, on the initial conditions. So she studied uh, ballistic trajectories of uh, particles launched with offset from L2. So these two plots show the final energy as a function of this offset. And you can see that uh, in the close vicinity of L2, uh, there is uh, quite a large area where the final energy is, uh, is positive uh, for, uh, for the expected range of mass ratios. So even when we uh, launch the particles with uh, less correlation than, uh, than applied by the orbit, maybe 90 to 80%, there are still regions of positive energy uh, for the particles. <coughs> But one has to keep in mind that the Lagrange points change their <coughs> position because the balance between centrifugal acceleration and gravitational acceleration changes. So what's the hatched? Oh, the hatched, those are areas that collide, uh, where particles collide with the binary. Oh, OK. So you know, L2, the modified L2 point. And then they re-enter the, the Roche lab? Uh, yeah, yeah they, they go out and collide with, uh, Understood. Uh, with this potential. But there is also. Uh, the possibility that uh, particles or streams launched from different uh, points uh, collide with each other, as was nicely shown by Morgan uh, in uh, his paper last year. So what does this mean for V1309 scope? Uh, this plot here shows the projection of temperature in SPH of the calculation in the orbit plane. And it shows that as the stream goes out, it expands, temperature decreases, but less than you would expect because there is molecule formation. And as it goes out, it collides with itself. The spiral shock uh, 
normalizes about 5 to 10 percent of the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of the outflow is determined by tidal torquing of the binary, so it's a way of converting the orbital energy into radiation. The shocks are actually radial. The particles compose the radial from, uh, from outside of, uh, of this radius. So imagine we are looking at the contact binary in the center through this material. If we're looking in this direction, the stream is close, dense, and has high optical depth, and would block the light from the binary. This would correspond to one of the maxima, because we see the maximum surface area. If we look from the other direction, the stream is farther away, it has dispersed, optical depth is lower, uh, there will be less, uh, less blocking of the light. So uh, we can run, uh, run calculations of this uh, and try to understand them with the analytic model. And this movie shows uh, how a binary would look like uh, with L2 muscles uh, that is progressively increasing in muscle rate. And the bottom panel shows the corresponding uh, corresponding integration of this, so the phase type. You can see that as M build increases, we naturally get the transition from uh, from double hump curve to a single hump curve as uh, uh, as the system loses this uh, mirror symmetry with respect to the binary axis. So I think this is pretty suggestive that L2 muscles was responsible for observed behavior. And uh, this also allows us to uh, do certain <coughs> things. So this only works for a certain range of inclinations, like 60 to 85 degrees. And this allows us to break uh, the degeneracy between mass ratio and inclination in light curves of contact binaries, and gives us mass ratio of this object between 0 0.07 and, uh, and 0.10. So we can take this one step further, and we can compare the light curves that we have here with the theoretical light curves to some sort of uh, chi by i, and determine the muscle history of the binary. That's shown here. The red points are what we infer from the light curve, and the gray area is the directly observed orbital period change uh, coupled together with the mass ratio that we get from the light curve. So the match is uh, pretty good, but it's not perfect, and uh, part of the reason is that we have huge uncertainties in opacity of material that is 2 to 3,000 Kelvin and has optical depth of 1, and we need the opacities uh, in I band. So there's actually orders of money. But I think this is pretty suggestive that uh, perhaps the L2 muscles was fully responsible uh, for, uh, for the observed orbit period of change. And this is only due to loss of angular momentum uh, due to these muscles from, uh, from L2. So I want to understand both of them. So the uh, gray band and the period change that you observe, convert that to an M dot by assuming that it's By assuming that it's up. And then the other one is just your phase light curve, right? It's, okay. <coughs> so it looks okay, but it's on log scale, right? So um, with, I guess with the more magnitude, right? Uh, yeah, I was saying the, you know, this, the red points depend on opacities. Okay. And we don't know the opacities. The uncertainty is probably better than that. All right. Because it's not, it's not Roslyn. So that's, that's potentially complicated. So what happens next? Uh, when the muscle strain increases enough, the binary disappears and the light increases. So we do not see the binary, but we see the spiral shock inside this outflow, and the luminosity should be proportional to m dot uh, as a function of time. So this is only 150 orbits, and we can directly simulate this with our SPH. And we put in m dot as a function of time and reproduce uh, this light curve uh, that, uh, that is shown here. There is uh, one caveat, which I can discuss in more detail, which has uh, some potential implications or, uh, or uh, relations to what's happening in the binary. But maybe the easiest explanation for what uh, needed to happen here is this change in L2 morphology that was discovered by, uh, by, Morgan, uh, by Morgan last year. So we can put uh, the M dot. Uh, as a function of time on the same plot that, uh, that we had before. And you can see that it relatively well matches. So we have three different things uh, that seem to show a consistent trend of increasing uh, of increasing end of time. So this means that the binary existed as two separate entities all the way just to a final few days uh, before, uh, before, the main, before the evolution became dynamical. And that also there was substantial muscles 
in order to explain all of this that happened so before the main peak, we needed to lose maybe 500 of solar mass. So in our previous work by Natasha and her group showed that to explain the main peak, we need a few hundreds of solar masses of ionized hydrogen in a little type 2 plateau super. But this uh, expansion that happened here did not happen in the vacuum, uh, as was already shown, uh, shown by Brian. And it's kind of natural that we get uh, we get uh, free expansion in the polar direction and uh, uh, compression in the in the orbital plane, and uh, uh, and that uh, this mechanism or this uh, scenario is actually relevant in, in other geometries like supernovae and classical novae, and we are now looking into this with hydro simulations with uh, with my poster. So uh, I, I think this illustrates very well that L2 mass loss was happening over hundreds or thousands of orbits in the V1309 orbit. There are substantial mass loss associated with this. And this could have uh, significantly changed the structure of the binary and of the, of the orbit before the dynamical phase uh, ensued. But this is, of course, not uh, the final word because uh, we still need to explain the basic thing. What determines mass loss as a function of time? Uh, what happens there? How can we access these very long time scales numerically? And how do we uh, connect uh, what we know now, like 1D and fully compressible simulations, with what we see in these transients? There is, of course, the question of magnetic fields. And uh, how do we predict, or how do we connect these simulations with what we observe? given that there are uh, aspherical shocks, dust, and molecules. So if you or somebody you know is interested, I have uh, three positions to exactly these questions. Sorry, it's here. Thanks for attention. Now, how guy. But do we do questions or is that after? We do questions or? afterwards, or we yeah. do questions yeah. interject. Yeah. Yeah. You forget it's about your questions. <laughs> like to call it alternative views, but just key physical processes <laughs> in common and global evolution. Um, so let us begin. Um, so this work. Yeah. So uh, if you think about common uh, and global evolution, of course, we have tons of different problems, the issue is uh, understanding them. Um, but if I just summarize some of them, I can talk about the, whether the envelope is like, you know, many, in many of our simulation, the envelope is only partially ejected, also material is not ejected. In some other simulation, it's going much better than that. Uh, the final orbits are potentially wider than what they observed. 
and uh, I'll discuss it a bit, actually related to uh, what was discussed in the previous message, uh, uh, about the time scale for mass loss and common error might be you know, different than what we expect you know, regarding the dynamical time scale. So basically, the difficulty is suggest you have some missing physical elements. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is some new models that could suggest some extra important physical aspect of them. And we can think about various different issues related to all both of these problems. Uh, some of them related, for example, in order to eject the envelope, you might need extra energy sources with recombination. Uh, I'll discuss a bit cold luminosity or radiation. We'll talk about accretion energy. And maybe some extra gravitational energy can uh, extract. Uh, <coughs> the other problem is actually how to couple your energy or momentum sources into the gas itself, the envelope, and how to actually uh, eject it. So that related to capacity, convection mechanism, I'll discuss dust driven winds, and potentially jets or outflows, and issues of foldbacks, and of course, you cannot do without pupils at all. So, one of the main issues is that AGB stars, they are single stars, know how to eject an envelope. They can eject the same mass as we observe in, or expect in, in binary common energy evolution. And they can do it all by themselves without any companion. How do they do that? Well, it turns out we can actually go back 30, 40 years, and the same idea that we suggest now for common energy <coughs> already discussed years ago. So one of the suggestions was the combination energy, which uh, Natasha studied a lot. And the other possibility is dust driven wind, which I'm going to discuss now. Uh, in the case of AGB stars, the paradigm now is that actually it's about dust driven wind, and the combination energy was suggested to be not to be efficient enough uh, in those cases. Um, but I will not discuss of course, uh, this uh, first uh, issue here. So how does it actually work for dust driven wind? Then you have an AGB star, okay? So uh, it suddenly puffs up through doing stir evolution. And at some point, it actually can start to pulsate and source some material and actually have an even ex more extended envelope during its evolution. This envelope could actually become large enough, or no, puffy enough that it, the temperature cool, it cools down very fast it starts to produce dust, okay? So you have, uh, start to produce dust particles. And now these dust, dust particles basically change your opacity. So if you can think about, you know, uh, addictive luminosity, effectively once you change your opacity, you can actually go beyond, you know, beyond addictive luminosity for this case, and you start having throwing winds. So radiation, you know, connects with the dust particles, drive them away. If it's dense enough here, the dust particles actually drive the gas, couple to the gas, and drive the gas with them, and they start to producing these uh, very slow winds that over time, over a long time scale of about 10 to the 5 or even 10 to the 6 years, can completely eject all of the angles. So with this mechanism, AGB stars can eject a lot of mass, but over a very long time scale. What happened in our case? Well, if it's AGB, actually if it's AGB star, as I said, you can, they can do it by themselves, they don't need, even need a binary. What about red giants? Red giants are much smaller. Even if they have some uh, uh, you know, reactions, they don't actually puff up as much as to get to this critical radius where dust starts to form. So you actually cannot you know, eject so much mass from my giants using this mechanism. So what happens when we have common envelope? So this is our simulation, very similar to all of the other simulations. Uh, this is with gadget two. By the way, all of this work is by Hilan Grants, my uh, master's student, now my PhD. And what you can see immediately, of course, that this whole star the envelope, the common envelope, puffs up and becomes very, very large. So, how does it look like? If you think about an irregular HB star, there's some of this size actually when it, uh, uh, when it puffs up during this uh, kind of oscillations, it can go to this critical radius, as I said, and form dust. If you look about the post, you know, kind of post common envelope binary, you can see it's very big. Note that actually it's a different uh, distances. It easily goes beyond this critical radius. So if you think about this, how it looks like an AGB star, and this would be the post-common envelope distribution of material uh, around, the, around the star. Of, if I look on the cumulative mass distribution in this post-common envelope uh, case, but you can see this is the critical radius that will <coughs> start to form. In order for dust to form, you need both low enough temperatures and high enough density so you can actually uh, uh, grow. And you see that most of the mass is actually beyond this critical radius, so you actually have a lot of dust around here. So in principle, the luminosity from the core of the star now irradiates this dust, and exactly like an HB star, so you could actually eject material. So essentially, the common envelope transforms an RG, a red giant star into an AGB-like star, and now the same mechanism of dust driven wind can work 
and they operate over long time scale. And these time scales, they, of course, depends on the luminosity, right? The total momentum transferred to the envelope uh, you know, depends on the luminosity. Of course, the efficiency of uh, how much of this momentum is can be actually coupled to the, uh, coupled to the uh, dust or gas. But in principle, it could be comparable time scale for AGB, or likely a bit, uh, uh, actually a bit faster, because it's even more extended than AGB, so it's easier to actually eject the material. So it's very likely to happen on time scale of, I don't know, between 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, but maybe even 10 to the 5 years. So very long time scale, certainly longer than typical dynamic time scale that we expect in a, in a new power system. And so time scale, so it's very important to understand what's the time scale for mass loss in uh, common error binary, and I'll discuss now how can you actually measure this time scale. And this should also be related to maybe uh, binary nebula. In principle, as I said, the AGP stars and post-common nebula uh, cases could be very similar and should appear very, very similar. The main difference maybe is that AGP stars should be much more spherical, well, uh, common envelope uh, binaries should produce a much more you know, asymmetric uh, distribution of material. So uh, maybe, I would suggest this, I discussed it uh, yesterday, I think, with uh, Osola, maybe all the planetary nebula which show spherical configuration are just regular AGB stars, but all those which are not are actually coming from common uh, binary evolution. And the reason they are so similar, and actually the measured mass loss in this planetary nebula, is what Osola told me, are 10 to the minus 4 or 5, something like that. So this is not times, this is not the masses rate you expect for dynamical ejection. We eject you know, a few solar masses potentially over a time scale of uh, years, even at the most hundreds of years. So this is much faster, this is much slower, and this is consistent with this kind of mechanism, and you know, this potentially can expand these two types of uh, planetary nebula, and why they are so similar, although one of them is a common envelope, one of them is an ATP star. So how can you actually measure the time scale of common envelope evolution? So I would suggest well, stickles. Um, so let's say I have a common envelope uh, binary, but let's say I have a third very wide companion. So we also already mentioned it two days ago, but uh, I'll discuss just a bit more. So if the mass loss time scale is short, much shorter than the orbital period, in principle, this third companion sees this mass ejection as almost like a kind of prompt mass loss, like a supernova, it actually gets a kick and can be disrupted if the mass loss is uh, high enough. Okay. Either that, or it could actually change its orbit and become much more eccentric, etc. So in principle, if you have a distribution of the same major axis of uh, wide binaries or genitals, and then we have a distribution of wide binaries which, which have a post common level binary a primary, they should, the difference between them should actually measure the time scale and the uh, and evolution of these muscles. So can we do that? In principle, we can. So we can take very wide main sequence binary. What we see here is the separation. And uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, can get this using Gaia. And you can see the distribution of some major axis, multiple distribution of wide main sequence, main sequence binaries. And then we can check what happens for various types of post-common envelope binaries or something that experience a common envelope, like uh, SDB styles, post-common envelope binaries, uh, CVs. And first of all, each of them, you can immediately see that they are very different. This is just a cumulative. It's actually what it doesn't show and show in the next uh, uh, slide is uh, you actually lose many of these binaries. So cumulative just normalized to one, but it's not only the distribution of the major axis which changes. So you know, as I said, you can actually become, <coughs> become, potentially become more eccentric, uh, but it's also how many of them are actually lost from the system through these kicks. In principle, if it was just an adiabatic mass loss, what you would expect is you take the uh, you know, separation of main sequence, main sequence of binaries, and just more or less move it to the right by a factor of two, three, depending on the mass rate, um, uh, initial and final uh, mass ratio. This is certainly uh, not the case. So it's certainly not adiabatic, which is not what made this surprising. It, well, to be adiabatic, really, it needs to be very long time scales. But it's not very clear whether, what about the dynamical. If you actually do not normalize it, just, uh, but actually take the, the actual fraction, this is not really well measured. So I'm not sure this is the case. But it seems like at least 50% or so of the white binaries are actually disrupted uh, because of it in, the, in, this, in this case it's for SDP stars or post common error binaries. And if you need to find a mass loss time scale which could be consistent with effectively transforming this into this. So in a sense, this is a measure. So this is a work in progress I'm doing uh, with uh, my former PhD students, Elzmi Chaimin, of postdoc Andrei Goshev. Uh, we already showed in his, uh, my paper with uh, Elzmi Chaimin that the in case of two specific systems, the most likely time scale that we found after were actually about 10 to the 4 years. 
is this normalized over some volume that you are sort of yes, you look up assuming some, is complete? Yeah. yeah, so you look up to some volume uh, that Gaia can, you know, if you have relative yes. completeness up to, of course, we cannot see the faintest star companion, yeah. but we do the same normalization both for the main sequence, main sequence, and for okay. our post common okay. so irrespective and of... And that's how the that, cumulative distribution yeah. can happen. And there okay. shouldn't be many biases regarding post common for binaries versus just main sequence, main yeah. sequence in this, in this context. Okay. okay. But as I said, it's a work in progress, but in principle, this is a very interesting observational tool <coughs> that we have not used until now to actually measure the time scale. And as I said, in one case, we'll actually look on two specific systems where we know the masses was very large, mm -hmm. so we can certainly know that should, most of the cases should be actually disrupted, <laughs> We get that, and they are not distorted because we see the third companion at very large separation of uh, thousands of AU, even more. And uh, it's most consistent, let's say, with about 10 to the 4 years, but no, this is not the, uh, the definite answer. It's something that we need to look on the statistics. Um, okay, so this is about last even means. Uh, I will discuss some uh, mechanisms I'm not working on, but at least mention them. Uh, it's important we discuss them uh, here. So we could actually have accretion energy, right? Uh, additional energy that you can get from accretion material on, for example, the in spiraling object, especially if it's a compact object, but not necessarily only in this case. So if it has non negligible accretion and you can couple this accretion energy into the gas, you can actually transfer energy and eject uh, eject this is a series through some jets or disk outflows. So I think uh, non is the main uh, one of the main proponents of, uh, of this uh, idea. And uh, so he, he asked me to show one of uh, one of his movies. What they have here is a very common variable, but you cannot see, but you actually produce jets. You see it in a, a second when they move to a different view of, uh, uh, of this. And now you can see kind of from above, and you can see these uh, jets going on. And this is, it's always on the edge of the binary, of the, uh, of the, you know, giant star, and kind of takes off the envelope, uh, kind of uh, one, uh, one chain after another. We call this grazing uh, common envelope, grazing ev uh, evolution. So, where does this work? It depends really on the microphysics of the accretion itself, which are not very well understood, of course. And the other thing is, of course, that you need to be self-consistent. This movie is not self-consistent. It says that the child so, does so, chose specific uh, accretion, which is constant in time, okay? And some specific uh, uh, you know, conditions for the jet that they uh, eject, et cetera. <coughs> but in principle, you need to be self-consistent. So amount of accretion is related to amount of energy that you release. As long as you don't do this, it's not self-consistent. Might, uh, you, know, you should actually have this regulating mechanism and feedback. It might not work. It's not very clear that you can actually accrete enough material to get enough energy from that. So there are many issues, but certainly it's an interesting physical aspect that we need to think about. It's not trivial, but it's not important. It's very likely that in some cases it could have some uh, important aspect. At least even just observation, if it's not important for the common network itself, it might be very important, very interesting to see observation, and we should actually certainly look for that. Um, and, uh, and, and take a uh, and think about it. Um, well, I told you it's not about just boundaries. We should think about triple common and drop. I know we have enough trouble trouble <laughs> with binary <laughs> common and drop, but uh, if you actually want to understand triple population synthesis uh, evolution, we need to also understand the triple common and drop that can happen. Especially given that these four massive stars, most of them actually reside in triples or higher multiplicity. So for certainly for massive stars, this is critical. Less important for Roma star, but still even there. A very you know, non-negligible fraction of all uh, 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 stars, uh, even normal stars with in triples. So with my students here now, we actually try to start to do this uh, uh, triple common envelope. So again, we have a different star. So this is something different from what most of you have shown until now. Now you can actually see the binary. Of course, the phase space of generation is much, much larger because now we have all this information, the different binaries in a binary separation, etc. The nice, interesting thing is that, okay, you start having this trading arm, but now we have this energy coming from the gravitational energy of the binary itself. But guy, right? what's the mass? Uh, in this case, I think it was, what was it? I think it was eight and a half, no, two half and a half, I think. If I remember correctly, I, I need to check this. Uh, it's actually the same, exactly the same mass ratios as I showed you in the first simulation, but now the companion was, uh, com uh, was uh, replaced by these two stars. Each one of them have half the mass of the original. So now you can see that you actually eject, in some you actually have this propel thing and you eject, and it goes around, it has extra energy, and now we have this complication evolution because you actually disrupted the binary and we actually become very, very complex and involves both the dynamics and the, and the common and higher dynamics. In order to actually study the dynamics accurately, we kind of <coughs> couple a kind of a more accurate end body case with the higher dynamics. Yeah. So, right, if you have a triple system typically only stable if there's a hierarchy. It looks like in these mergers, 
probably a significant reaction you're going to have a third body ejected. Yes. Is it possible to look like in guide data, see like remnants of mergers, and then see if there's some star that has a trajectory that might have been ejected from its intestines hypothesis? Yes, so I would suggest actually to look on planetary nebula which have very unique uh, no, a structure because it would be different even the, the, the post coronal binary binary nebula because of this different ejection and especially for them maybe look for a search companion because uh, but in principle it is possible to do this guy uh, as long as the time scale short enough that it didn't get uh, too far okay um, and oh this, this does a different configuration it's just fun to show the movies uh, so this is a different configuration with different disputation and actually the whole evolution looks very differently. And well, it's not surprising if triple, triple evolution could be highly chaotic, so certainly the last stages could be highly complex. So right. the, initially it looks not that different, it takes a bit longer, but then later on as it goes, you can start to see how it becomes more eccentric. It starts with a circular orbit, this binary, and it becomes more eccentric. You can see it from the you know, from its movement at the time scale of the pericenter versus the upper center. And at some point, of course, you know, excited eccentricity becomes more separated, and then it will actually become uh, disruptive even earlier than the, in the previous case. Again, you can see this trailing arm around this uh, orbit. You can start extracting some energy uh, from the binary itself at the same time. And then it starts going uh, in spiraling into the, into the envelope. As I said, this case is actually much longer. It takes a longer time for this to happen. But now you start already getting to the disruption regime. Second, I think. A guy? Yes. What is the initial ratio of the periods that you do? So you can see. So actually, we tried different uh, different cases, but you could actually just see from the separation. So this red giant is about 80 uh, solar radii, I think, and so and it's a bit about that. I think it's uh, one in uh, 10, if I remember correctly. Okay, so it starts to settle, as you can see. The final case where it's rejected, and uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're going away. <laughs> so this is just actually for your question about Gaia. Okay. <laughs> it's coming back. Okay, I'll uh, just finish with a. Uh, let me just let me finish and ask. So I'll just finish with another observational aspect uh, in the uh, uh, no, era of uh, gravitational waves. So I think about the futures, uh, well, 40, 50 years from now, not LIGO, but uh, Lisa or Decigo. So what I show here is actually, if you look on the common envelope, right? Evolution. This is very simplified. It's actually not full hydro, but a very simplified uh, kind of gas dynamical friction evolution. But it's a, it's a bit different. But uh, it actually is illustrated with actually a different kind of orbit, depending on the mass. Whether it's a white dwarf, a neutron star, whatever <coughs> that goes into the envelope, you can see this in spiral. And as I said, as I told you before, this uh, in spiral changes the acceleration of the binary, uh, not to gravitational waves. But you can actually get to the gravitational wave regime where you can actually detect it. And then you can see this acceleration through a very unique kind of gravitational wave signature, which is actually different. And you can actually calculate the strains, etc. And uh, you should actually have a very different evolution than what you expect through gravitational waves. right? Because the dissipation is not through gravitational wave, but through this gas drive, and so gas friction. But the emission gravitational wave is coming from that. And if you actually want to look on how it looks on the you know, strain analysis, you can see it's, of course, for different uh, kind of binaries, but you can actually get it uh, with a, a very large signal to noise ratios, in some cases, even in the Lisa band. Of course, the rate of this might be, might be very small, so you want, you want to get, right? What distance? What? Ah, sorry, this is, so this is for, like, if I remember correctly, this is for 10 kiloparsecs. So this is a galactic case. Okay? So if you want to, you know, uh, Rescale it, of course, with extra gravity, then of course it goes down like the, like the mass. And this is why I said that in LISA, you might not be able to do anything extra galactic. With Decigo, you should be able to do extra galactic. Mm -hmm. And then the rate become, uh, become actually sensible in the sense that you might actually even detect, it, detect mm -hmm. this. But actually, this is our lower limits, because what we had here is this just simple guide dynamical friction approach. Uh, the next step is actually taking the full evolution from our uh, high common envelope. What typically happens is that it's actually the inspire is a bit slower than in this case. And the slow inspire actually gives you a better signal and it's actually going to be increased. Because what you see here, these are white dwarf, white dwarf inspires without any gas, that's gravitational wave. So in principle, this is the upper limit that you can get. But what we should expect is something actually in the middle between what we show here and something which, uh, 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 which goes over, over there. So anyway, it's interesting. It's not for now, for the future. I think it's an uh, interesting uh, aspect. And I basically uh, finish with that. So dust streamer reads, I think, are critical 
whatever mechanism you want to do, you, you know, puff up the envelope. You should have form. You should form dust. Actually, I don't need to say that you should form dust because in all of these dusty tra transients, we see that dust is forming. So we know dust is there, even from observations. So dust is formed. You should eject winds, irrespective, irrespective of the way you do it. But I suggest it actually could be a main mechanism for ejecting, uh, ejecting the envelope. Uh, uh, even in the cases where other mechanisms don't work, this should always be there because the core luminosity of the of the remnant is pretty high. It could do it over time scale of 10 to the 4 years or so. And I did mention one thing, which is fallback material. I think it's also important. We didn't discuss it enough here. In principle, if you eject material and it falls back, you can actually extract a bit more energy or angular momentum from that. I think it's something we should discuss more. And for this, we need to do actually very long simulations. So I think that much to that, but I think it's also an interesting aspect. And finally, triples are interesting and important. First of all, just as observational, using them for observation constraints, very different from other type of observation constraints that we have now. We can actually use them. And very preliminary results suggest that it could actually be long time scale, but uh, hopefully I have a more definitive answer about that in the coming uh, months or two, and then when we submit the paper. And um, three very common variable is important and interesting. Uh, we should go at some point beyond binaries, because triple are important, as I said, mostly for massive spell, but uh, uh, overall. And you should remember gravitational waves are becoming part of our arsenal for uh, studying any physical process, in, including common and group uh, evolution. mentioned the problem uh, that the binaries remain too light uh, in the end. So how, how can we solve it? Ah, so this can potentially be done using maybe this material fallback, this is what I mentioned. Yeah. So you can extract extra angular okay. momentum for this after it fallback. So you know, it lose energy, it cools down, and you know, shocks a bit, it fall back, you can extract some potential uh, momentum. Some, there was some discussion of this resonant interaction that can actually extract uh, angular momentum from, from the orbits. That also related to this extraction, production of uh, eccentricities for larger separation uh, orbits. So these are some of the possible uh, ways. For myself, I still want to better understand the observation whether how difficult is our problem with small separations. I think it's something still to be look, looked on, and whether how really critical is problem for which kind of binaries. You know, look on very specific binaries. We certainly have a look on massive binaries in this, in this uh, context, etc. So it's a potential problem, and some of these uh, aspects, uh, I think that uh, this recognition Natasha can get them a bit uh, right, a bit deeper, I think, uh, in this file. So <coughs> there are several possible solutions. I don't have the answer. The dust-driven winds certainly do not help in that context. Okay? So dust-driven winds certainly can easily help, and so I think can easily solve any uh, ejection problem. I think they can easily do it on long, on long time scales, but they can easily do it. They cannot help you very much with the, with the deeper instance. <coughs> well, to comment on the first part, because first, I don't think it's an alternative part. I think it's actually part of what we have already developed. And I'm talking about people like Natasha and myself. And specifically, I don't think you have seen our paper, the paper of my student Matthew Clayton on that, because the whole paper is just about that. And we show that after this dynamical plunge in phase, what we call the slow spiral in phase, the common envelopes does resemble an AGP star, and we show that you get these episodic mass ejections, exactly like you described, except that the role of dust is a little bit different, but we eject the envelopes on a time scale of 1,000 years, so that's exactly what you're saying. And it's a fully self-considered calculation of the yeah. estimates. Hey, I certainly know the paper, I look at it. Uh, well, that's exactly the whole paper, the whole 20 pages are just about that. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say this, I can, well, Probably have been our referee on this paper, right? And we discussed, we can actually show you exactly the number of times dust is actually mentioned there. And you know, the importance of, uh, of dust is not there. The only computation issue and then you know, the, some people going and coming yeah, up and down, that's, that's not an issue. But At least, if I understood correctly the paper, the actual dust you know, the coupling and all of this dust driven wind is not a main part, at least not in the, the paper I wrote. But no, the dust forms later, sure. Yeah, but that's an interesting question, I think, in terms of talk, because it, I think in, in your model, maybe dust is not a fundamental ingredient. If that's the case. It, it does form and it does accelerate ultimately. Okay, but, but it, it's not the but basic. This is my issue, right? Should, I'm talking dust. Right. No, 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 but let me finish. If that's not the basic ejection mechanism. It's very important because you're making a claim that dust would be a key to help the removal. So that will mean that 
this process as a strong Middle East independence, uh, which is something interesting and potentially testable. So I think that it's nice that there are two ideas that are on the same line, but maybe using different mechanisms, and maybe studying a little bit more that the role of dust is a good idea. Well, I would say it this way. So dust was taken back on the calculations. The point was is that the instability which is developing in case when this star is moving into HB, and that HB is more expanded and cooler than a normal HB. So that instability starts to do the mass ejection faster than normal HB wins. Mm -hmm. So you, if, I, if I said, I don't think it's 10 to the 5 even earlier. But, uh, as I said, this, is, this will be relevant even if you don't have important uh, to mesh energy, or so maybe for massive star or the other one. As I said, that is important, could couple to other mechanisms. It's not it's not a replacing of any other mechanism. That's the thing. It's important physical aspect that needs to be so incorporated in any kind of. Uh, it's true. What I, what I would say though is that something you haven't mentioned much when you're. It's not just that you're turning a, a red giant in AGB. What you're doing, you're changing the luminosity to mass ratio. That's an important point. That's, that's what drive. Two, yes, yeah. That's what drive the instability of the envelope. Then once you get there, sure, you know you can do massless. You get lower temperature. You get dust, and then you can add. Radiation pressure on dust that can help you harder. I think it's it's true that to get there you need to change all around. Otherwise, you never get there. So one thing to also take on, into account when you have these uh, mechanisms that act over a longer time scale is that you also have part of the envelope that while things are being ejected by instabilities or dust is going to fall back dynamically and then thermally, and that is going to interplay with the orbit. Yeah, that's what I had as a shell here with ejection. But that and the orbit could both. The back was triggering the ejection. Yeah. And the orbit could both uh, become yeah, smaller and lar or larger depending it didn't on the angle of the moment. orbit. It just the envelope itself. It's instability in the orbit itself, which was triggered by fallback. But the inner parts will also play a role, and well, they are it's bound. It's so much decoupled. It doesn't reach the. Inner part but while you're ejecting the envelope, you can't afford to merge every single system. That's what I'm saying. Right. Because you've got time, and and some of the envelope is going to fall fall in inside. The, the inside part is not unbound at all. It's just lifted at the just after the dynamical in spiral. The envelope's lifted kind of out of the way, and in the meantime, it's going to fall in, fall onto the orbit, and the orbit is going to change. It has so much momentum. I mean, it's not very much. But right. Think that, about this at this distance, but it cannot fall back all the way down without losing that envelope. It takes, and it's much much longer than your time scale for the fallback. So as a result, you cannot have a full fallback. Yes, it's not just dynamic or ballistic. It's... I have a question because I really don't understand what's the difference between the grazing common envelope and just a mass loss, honestly speaking. I mean, when you rotate around, I mean, for me, it's a mass loss. Why, why do you need to call it as a grazing common envelope? I mean, I mean, any invention of a new term just confuses people, right? I not my uh, <laughs> main paper or whatever. I just wanted to mention this issue. So I think the important thing was that putting this grazing in the name, probably that if you are fully enveloped, right, it might be not a, a it might not be very very well efficient in actually producing this jet. If it's the outside, you can get this accretion. Yeah, and it's you just normal mustard. No, it's so not. It's, it's, it's a much okay. different the way the jet, the, the, the sculpting of the outer envelope by the jet. You're literally ripping away the outer parts of the envelope by the jet. Can I? intervene. So no one did this grazing envelope evolution, which is not self-consistent in that there's no self-gravity, right? So I made an honest man out of him and invited a student to come and do the same, but with the Enzo common envelope simulation. So Sagiv came and we did exactly what we've always done with, with a jet. So it's not grazing anymore. It's smashing into the pasture, right? It's going in uh, norm normally. And so the two big differences are that the final separations are wider. And the other one that you have about 30% envelope unbinding, so a bit more. So if the jet were to happen, and that's a big if, because of course, as Morgan showed, maybe the disks are not so happy inside the common envelope. But if the if the jet happened that way, you eject a bit more, you're left a bit wider, but ultimately maybe it's it helps. A it's a normal common envelope with some some gizmo on top. I, I disagree yeah. with that. I mean, I think that you know the. I mean, because that was a first cut at that simulation, and there's a lot more to be done there. And you'd expect, you know, you're going to get, it's going to be hard to not, what we understand about jets and disks is that during, you know, anything that's happening beforehand, uh, before you get to common envelope, you probably already have, you already have a disk. That's going to be pretty hard not to avoid. If you have a disk, you're going to get a jet. 
And so you're coming into a, a um, into common envelope already driving material out at what could be significant mass loss rates, right? You're going to get a tenth of the of the uh, accretion rate into the jet, right? So once that hits the um, the outer layers of the common envelope, you're going to do quite a bit of damage. Now, whether or not, I mean, I'm not sure it's going to actually fundamentally change your orbital separations, but it's going to change your star quite a bit. And, and at some point it may quench. I mean, this is the question that, you know, we've been asking. Um, but it's, you probably are going, be, are going to be able to get quite a ways down before you quench. So I think, you know, we should expect jets out of these systems because we know that every time you get accretion happening, pretty much you get a jet in these kinds of things. So we should expect a jet, and the jet can do quite a bit of damage. Yeah, I mean, but the jet, it depends on what you assume about the opening angle. And of course, if you enforce that the spiraling will take a long time, then your jet may provide the damage. But if it's, it's not just an orbital period, no. So it's right. The spiral is pretty regular, it's, but of it's course, probably, it's probably likely that the jet is more influential in the Roche lobe phase, where it's not going to be yeah. hitting the envelope just because you have longer time. Right. Well, it's yeah. the question yeah. of the time scale for. Yeah. All right. I have a question. Um, so, like, um, uh, a question for the slow injection question. Um, so uh, we had a bunch of discussions about the, the right. Um, what, what's the right uh, measure of when stuff gets blown off the star? Uh, whether it's be just showing mechanical or basically thermal energy, right? Uh, and the argument against thermal energy was that like puffs up, radiates away, cools down, and now you're, and you're, now you're toast, right? But then the slow injection scenario, you still have the same problem, right? Because you have to keep stuff at a fairly large separation for a long period of time, and the only way to do that, right, is basically you have to include the thermal energy. Case. So how do you avoid cooling in that scenario? Well, but the cooling is radiative cooling at the surface. That's of course all included in the right. right. And in fact, when you get these unstable pulsations, and yeah. unstable, but, but they reach a certain amplitude, namely when the cooling dominates and takes out the energy. But then they grow, and once every 10 years or so, they actually, the pulsation is actually it becomes a shock which is partially driven by recombination, and that provides episodic ejection events. I see. And that's so all calculated so completely self-consistent. So thermal energy is, 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 is not entirely radiated away in well, the simplistic just, picture that, um, we, that, that, that we've had basically in the well, dynamic. Well, you have a surface, and the surface radiates away. I, I, think, the the question, I think the, the, the question yeah. is, is how much, this is a standard standard what do you think about the total of, energy budget, right? Yeah. You're, you're, how much is coming out as integrated luminosity versus uh, How much integrated energy? mass loss, right? Yes. I mean, there's a ratio there, right? Um, and that's you know related fundamentally yeah. to the, the alpha in this <laughs> in the situation. Okay. Right? But all the luminosity, all the luminosity that's produced in the slow spiral yeah. is radiated away at the surface. Right, but some, of, that that some of it is some of it is going to go energy, yeah. kinetic energy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of it, right? And that's what I'm wondering is what the so we are, so, what so the alpha would be very small if you wanted to. Okay. Okay. So, so that's the, that's, the, that's the a very inefficient process in that regard. So, it, so, 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 the answer is that a fraction of thermal energy is ultimately converted to kinetic energy yeah. via these pulsations. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. this thermal energy yeah. is restored again by the radiation. By the radiation coming in. Okay. So, so roughly, what's that fraction? Ten percent. Ten percent. That's so helpful. Yeah, about 10%. less than 10%. Yeah, five, five to 10 percent. Five to 10 percent. It's actually, in terms of the alpha, is completely meaningless at that point. Right. right. It's an inefficient process in that.